Hi everyone, Bob Dietrich here with the ADHD Toolbox. We've got another episode for you and I am very excited about this episode. I know that I say that every time, but uh, I'm super excited about this one because we have Dr. Stephen Porges here. Um, he is the author of the polyvagal theory and, um, and he's gonna talk today about what that means and how it relates to ADHD. So uh, Dr. Porges, welcome to our show. Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and bringing me back to the area of uh, ADHD. And what I will share with you that in the early 1970s, which is quite a while back, I actually was doing uh, research in that area and uh, looking at physiological uh, indicators of ADHD and how that reflected kids' ability to pay attention. So it's like a coming home event for me right now. So thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Well, how did you, um, how, how and when did you come up with the polyvagal theory and what is that? Well, polyvagal theory really is a theory that enables us to have a better understanding of our bodily states and how they influence our behavior. And that's why it's very critical in any discussion about ADHD because ADHD is really a, a disorder of behavioral state regulation, but it's not just behavioral state, it's underlying physiological state. So polyvagal theory is all about physiological state and how it results in different emergent behavioral properties so that when our body's kind of like in states of defense, we're not very social. But when our body is safe, feeling safe and calm, we can engage others and bring them close to us. Polyvagal theory actually explains why and how that occurred from an evolutionary perspective of how the autonomic nervous system part of our nervous system that regulates the organs in our body, how that those neural structures regulating those organs changed as vertebrates evolved into mammals. And of course, mammals became humans, or we, we are mammals. And this is kind of an interesting story, because if we go back and look at our ancestors that are not mammals, reptiles, right. they don't have really social behavior in the way that we have it. And the social behavior from polyvagal perspective is all about co-regulating our physiological state through interactings with others. And so what we evolved as being mammals, we evolved the ability to uh, have uh, vocalizations uh, that conveyed our physiological state so that we could cue others that we were safe to come close to. We developed uh, a mechanism for uh, co-regulation or calming. And the, the archetype of that, of course, is the mother and the infant. But all humans need to be supported. And I should say all mammals at some point in their life need to be supported. Reptiles, when they are born, are on their own. Humans right. are not, and they can't be. That's not who we are. So I'd like to say that our biological imperative is to be connected and to be connected is to have the capacity to co-regulate, regulate our biobehavioral states with others. Got it, got it. So um, I also understand that the vagus nerve is involved, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, we got the issue when we start labeling nerves, people yeah. want to give the nerve, I use the term executive function or decision-making capacity. Right. And we have to have a better understanding of what nerves are. The vagus nerve connects the brain with the organs of the body. So it's really conveying uh, brain organizational principles to the regulation of our visceral organs. But it's also our major surveillance system of our visceral organs. So it's sending sensory information from our body into our brain and retuning what resources we have for cognition, for social behavior, or is it shifting it to be defensive. So the metaphor underneath all of this polyvagal theory is that try to keep your autonomic nervous system out of states of defense and everything will be fine. You'll be healthier, you'll be loved, you'll be able to, people will trust you and you'll be able to trust others. Mm -hmm. But when your body goes into states of defense, then you have a great difficulty in co-regulating and interacting with the other. Now the interesting part, and this is really where polyvagal theory it becomes a powerful underlying metaphor is before polyvagal theory uh, uh, would actually emerge, people used to think of the sympathetic nervous system, the system that gives you mobilization, but people would conceptualize it as a fight or flight system. Although we love it because we love to play, we love to move, they would, most people would see it as a fight, to, a fight or flight. 
-hmm. And the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the more of a calming one, the, the break, that's primarily all, all the organs in the parasympathetic nervous system are regulated through the vagus, or at least primarily. Mm -hmm. So the vagus became the um, basically the antidote to fight flight. And that was in a sense of balance. And people say you're autonomically out of balance when people would be tightly wrapped, anxious, or hyperactive. But polyvagal theory added an additional understanding of uh, the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system by identifying a second vagal pathway that we shared with more primitive vertebrates. And if we recall, uh, when reptiles get scared or threatened, they immobilize. Mm. They death faint. They appear not to be living. And visualize the fact that mammals often do this, like a mouse in the jaw of a cat. We will say that the mouse is playing dead. But in reality, the mouse is not playing dead. The mouse is just reflexively going into this more ancient defense mode. But many children have experienced this, uh, whether it's through abusive homes or even abusive classrooms, mm -hmm. where they will be yelled at and they'll just kind of like collapse. Mm -hmm. And if they had collapsed and shut down physiologically, later if they get similar cues of aggression, they may merely dissociate. And again, if we go into the world of ADHD, where children are often being uh, functionally yelled at or abused within classroom settings as well, mm -hmm. they are in a sense, dissociating. They're disappearing, but they're still in their body. So dissociation becomes a, a human adaptation to shutting down where you don't literally collapse, uh, pass out, and potentially defecate in your pants. Mm -hmm. So the body maintains its structure, but the mind goes someplace else. And that's part of this immobilization, or let's say adjustment of it. Yeah, I've, um, um, I noticed that myself within the relationships, right? Uh, you get in an argument, and my, my, uh, my personal go-to, and I know people watching this have this too, is they, they just shut down, they stop talking. And, uh, well, the, it, it, well, it's okay in a sense to stop talking and listening, yeah. but what you're really saying is they stop talking and disappear. And part of when we co-regulate, it's not disappearing, it's witnessing, which is meaning we're present for the other person. We may not be talking, but we're there, and that makes them feel good. Right. That's the co-regulation. Right, right, got it. So in regard to ADHD, what happens differently with, with this, the polyvagal theory in, in people with ADHD than they do with people that don't have that? Well, if we interpret uh, ADHD from a polyvagal perspective, mm -hmm. we, focus on the, we would focus on the feature that ADHD is really a state regulation disorder. The individual has difficulty regulating a physiological state that is safe and engaging and in a sense self-regulatory. Yeah. And so it used to be viewed that the behavior was uh, motivated and, it, and there was an intentionality. Therefore, punishment was always used and a lot of ADHD kids have been really uh, subjected to very strict behavioral uh, regulation models, you know, yeah. the ABA, but ABA or behavior mod is very useful in uh, dealing with behaviors that have low frequency of spontaneous emergence. So you have a low frequency be behavior, you can reward it and you have it more frequently. But with ADHD, the idea was to use behavior mod to reduce disruptive behaviors. And it's not very efficient. And this will be, it doesn't mean it's not helpful but it's not very efficient. And it's not very efficient because the body is in a state of defense when you have these uh, mobilized behaviors. It's really uh, a emergent property of the body being in a state of defense. And given that as a feature, then treatments for ADHD should be more in terms of how does one learn to use different tools. This is your toolbox model. Right. How do you learn to use different tools to regulate your physiological state? And this is where polyvagal would give you, uh, polyvagal theory would give you lots of hints. And one very powerful portal is how we breathe. And if we extend the duration of our inhalation, so we huff and we puff metaphorically, our bodies become more tightly wrapped, more anxious, more mobilized. We're literally preparing our bodies for fighting or fleeing. 
But if we reverse that strategy and inhale more rapidly and exhale extraordinarily slowly, then the vagus starts to have its impact because the vagal effects on our heart to calm us mm -hmm. from this newer mammalian vagal pathway starts to downregulate the sympathetic nervous system because what evolution teaches us about the autonomic nervous system, and this is what's embedded in polyvagal theory, is that the system is hierarchically organized. And once we understand that it's hierarchically organized, we have all the hints we need about how to enhance regulation. So the newer mammalian vagal circuit, uh, when that starts to work, it downregulates sympathetics, it calms us down. It enables the whole autonomic nervous system to work in a more homeostatic way. So what you'll find with many children who have ADHD is that they don't just have ADHD. They have some comorbidities, meaning they may have gut problems. They may have these visceral uh, problems that are treated as if they are separate from their whole behavioral problem. But right. if the behavioral problem is merely a reflection of a atypical neural regulation of autonomic state, the behavior comes out as hyperactive, but the gut gets turned off. And if the gut gets turned off, you have constipation and gut pains. But it's with this newer mammalian vagus, which is linked to the nerves that regulate the face. And, and what that really means is that our voice, our facial expressivity, and even how we regulate little muscles that are in our middle ear that enable us to extract human voice and background sounds. When that vagal pathway is working, we hear other people's voices more clearly and we calm our body down. And again, what are some of the other features of children with ADHD? They are continually accused of not listening, not following verbal instructions, mm -hmm. and being treated as if they're less intelligent than they really are because their expression of their intelligence is compromised by their bodies being in states of defense. And too often we have interpreted those behaviors as if they were intentional, as opposed to merely a reflection of the physiological state. So what I was really saying, one tool that we all have available is this ability to exhale slowly. And as we do that, it inhibits the sympathetic fight flight and we calm down. Can you show us like what that would look like? Would it be a, and then? No, no, it wouldn't be like that. Okay, how would it, it would, it, see nothing, a, a movement with that type of speed mm -hmm. is literally triggers to your body uh, that it's not safe. Got it. So it's really a relaxation where you. And you can extend it and as you exhale slowly, um, you calm down, but there are other tricks you can do. Well, meaning uh, that before we move on, though, is it like one second in, like five seconds out? Would you say? Well, or? I I wouldn't start initially there. I okay. I would start with maybe a ratio of like three to seven, three, uh, three because in and then seven seconds out. Three yeah, seconds and and the idea is if you can extend the ratios, uh, make them higher, uh, then it'll work even better. But the issue is you're, it's going to be a jolt to your body and some people may feel a little strange or dizzy with that because their bodies are really geared up. Yeah. But there are, well, I was saying there are ways of tricking the system. Okay. Singing, singing mm -hmm. is one. What do you do when you sing? You exhale slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, extending the duration of your phrases. What are you doing when you're talking? You're exhaling slowly. So I, I had, this is a real life situation. I had a colleague uh, who was introducing me at a meeting and there'd be there was going to be close to a thousand people at this meeting and she came up to me at a party the night before and she said Steve I'm very very scared petrified to introduce you tomorrow I'm really scared I said don't worry I'll fix it now and assuming that was enough I wouldn't hear from her 10 minutes to 9 which is when I was supposed to was talk at 9 she comes up to me and she says Steve fix it <laughs> now, I'm not going to criticize her for believing that I could fix it, but what I noticed was how she was speaking. She was basically taking a breath every time she said a word. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, you know, these gasping. She was basically getting her body worked up into a panic. And I said to her, I said, extend the duration of your phrases. 
And initially she could not even put two words together before taking a breath. And then it just kind of like clicked and then it expanded and expanded and expanded. And she gave a beautiful introduction. She's a clinical psychologist and now she uses this to treat people with public speaking anxieties. Excellent. But these are the features that we, in a sense, breathing is an autonomic response. We spend very little time thinking about breathing. If we don't think about it, we still breathe. But it's one of these gifts in our body that we can actually access our organs and how they work by just shifting how we breathe. So it's a powerful tool. And if we think about the history of humanity, which included chanting, singing, and even the notion of playing wind instruments. So in my talks, I used to, in a sense, since I was a clarinetist and I would like to talk from the perspective of a, of a wind instrument, I would say about the value of playing the clarinet or playing wind instruments, because not only was it exhaling, but I was listening and utilizing all the muscles of the face and head. So I was dealing with all these attributes of this calming system. And I'd always get this uh, feedback or flack really from people in the audience who were uh, percussionists or string players or keyboard players. And they said, we do the same thing. We breathe with the phrasing of the music. Mm. And so if you watch, you know, you see these YouTubes of concerts going on and watch the violinists. They're taking the, they're pulling in the air and they're, you know, breathing with the phrasing. And so music has been part of our history in terms of regulating this pathway of calming down and listening and breathing while we're listening. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm, um, I'm actually going to a music festival today and I'll, I'll bet you um, we do that while we listen to music as sure. well. Yeah. yeah. And it depends. So if we listen to kind of like um, anxiety provoking music, we will breathe in the other way. If we listen to ballads or love songs, yep. you know, romantic sounds, right. we go into that more relaxed state. So our bodies are responding to those cues. So uh, if a parent is uh, maybe struggling with a child that has mm -hmm. ADHD, they're hyperactive or whatever, putting calming music on could help. Having One them play help. an instrument yeah. could help. Yeah, I, I see what I always used to like to say, to, especially um, about with parents is play a recorder with your kid. It doesn't have to be a very skilled musical instrument, but it, it's not just playing the instrument. If you play it with someone else, you're now fostering that social interaction you're fostering co-regulation. So you're giving the child a tool that they can breathe in a different way. But once you put a musical instrument in their hands, you're providing them a way for regulating their state in a social context. Awesome. And that's really Super what I think is important. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because uh, you know, everything I've heard is social interaction is so key. And uh, we were just talking to the guy yesterday uh, about screen addiction and how that is taking away from the social interaction and and how you know what are strategies to get them back to be more social and so this is certainly another strategy to uh, keep more social to start yeah. play and, and social behavior is something you can't tell people to do you can't because it doesn't work you say be more sociable um, there are features that enable people to be welcomed or not welcomed what's their voice like what are they presenting? What are the cues? So we have to understand that a safe body, a person who feels safe, uh, projects cues to others to make them feel safe, and that's that co-regulation, and that's the social behavior. If an individual is mobilized all over the place and their face doesn't have animation mm -hmm. and smiles and reflections of other people's interaction, it's gonna push other people away. Excellent. Well, um, so it occurred to me that as we're talking here is that the, um, the breathing is one way to regulate the system. Are there other movements or other ways to, st to do that as well? Well, this is an interesting set of questions because once you start deconstructing our physiology, you start mm -hmm. finding different portals. And one was listening and you brought up the one listening to music. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually developed an intervention. It's called the Safe and Sound Protocol. Mm -hmm. And that takes uh, vocal music, but the computer alters it to emphasize the 
uh, frequencies of what I call the essence of safety and trust, like that which is in the mother's lullaby. Mm. And what it does is it's a neural exercise. It literally pulls the person into listening and then functionally modulates the frequency band. It's like a treadmill for that system. And this has major impact because it changes neural regulation, not just of the facial muscles, but also of the vagal regulation of the heart. It calms people down. And that's what that that's one way people can go towards us. I um I've seen a couple things on on YouTube where they are um like calming sounds, right? Not just like natural sounds. I mean those I, I I'm guessing those work as well, but they're also calming beats and and tones. I think it is. Well, it's actually uh, vocal music, and because you know there there's going to be a constituency that will be listening that will remember Johnny Mathis. Mm-hmm. And Johnny Mathis, uh, because this is my, my generation, mm-hmm. I was a tenor and his voice was very melodic mm-hmm. and it was used basically to make people feel safe with each other. It's what adolescents or teenagers use when they want to be close and physically close and didn't want to talk mm-hmm. um, because it was sending cues to each other that you're safe, that you can trust me, that I can hold you, I can be close to you. And when I talk about this in meetings, it's very interesting to see the people blush because the memories from their childhood come back. But it, it, it's a clear uh, point that we're listening to certain types of modulations of sounds, of vocal music, are triggers to our body to say, give up the hypervigilance, give up the guard, I can, I can be accessible and I won't be hurt. At least that's what the sounds are telling you. Um, so the uh, Safe and Sound Protocol was designed to, to literally rehabilitate a nervous system that was defensive, to basically give it exercises where it would try to extract these voices. And as it did that, it started to increase the neural regulation of the heart as well. And the, um, I got a patent for the technology, and one of the claims that was awarded was that of an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. So if you think of this whole notion and vagal nerve stimulation as a mechanism through which we change our physiological state. Mm -hmm. And to bring that full circle uh, back, uh, breathing as we exhale slowly, we're increasing that vagal activity to the heart through a a pathway of how the vagus is affected by inhalation versus exhalation, very much like a switch. Uh, When we listen to certain types of music, it's another switch coming through a different portal. And this can also enable us to relax and feel safe. Got it. Okay, so let's let's bring all this home if we can, and put it in a nice package for for the for the parents listening. Um, uh, and let's start with the breath, and then we'll go to the to the music strategy specifically. What would you think the uh, What would you recommend as far as a way to uh, start a parent with the with the breathing exercise if they were going to work with their child to help them regulate their their state and calm down? What would the uh, breathing exercise be uh, in, in, you know, kind of the second, uh, and, uh, you know, second? Well, we, we, we don't have to make anything up. We can go back to certain things that were taught or known decades or, or hundreds of years ago in yoga, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of yogic breathing. Mm-hmm. They were not all breathing of calming. Some of the breathing were also breathing of arousing. So you work on both in the sense, if you work both to calm and give a person also a breathing patterns or instructions on how to mobilize, their lethargy may disappear and they may become very mobilized, but you're giving them tools to aid in regulating their state. So it's not always about turning off our ability to be active. It's being calm in appropriate environments and active in other environments. And with ADHD, the boundaries are blurred because the child can't calm down in certain settings because the cues are too profoundly dangerous to the child. They're saying, I have to get the hell out of here. I have to mobilize. And classroom behaviors are really one of the issues because what are you supposed to do in a classroom? Sit still. Right. And so when you're, when it's time to sit still, um, I think the parents are looking for um, strategies on how to um, calm that anxiety yeah. uh, so they can sit still. Yeah, so I think breathing is probably the powerful one. And people can go to uh, 
you know, a pr the area of yoga that this is called, it's called pranayama yoga or yoga of breath. Got it. And uh, there are lots of things online on YouTube and on the internet where parents can literally get instructions. And as you go through that, even the issue of abdominal breathing. So as I said earlier, I said I was a clarinetist. Mm -hmm. And as a clarinetist, I was taught to uh, breathe by dropping my diaphragm or diaphragmatic breathing. Singers do the same thing. That's a more, even a more powerful way of getting the vagal effect because there are sensory, uh, sensory pathways from the diaphragm that help amplify the impact of the vagus on the autonomic nervous system. So one can, if we wanted to simplify it, we might say, well, uh, parents should have their, uh, provide opportunities for their children to learn to sing and have singing instruction or just singing for the fun of it. It doesn't, you don't need instruction, but you need to have the singing. Mm -hmm. And if they are more uh, leaning towards yoga things or even chants, those are another mechanisms through which the same nervous system gets stimulated. If uh, their bias is towards musical instruments, playing a wind instrument, uh, what I always like to say, it forces you into doing this. You have to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and so you do it without thinking that you're doing You think you're doing something else. Right. And now your body's shifting state. Right. So parents, if you decide to do the wind instrument, um, make sure you buy some earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Uh, okay, so that's great. Um, and uh, and I had asked this early, uh, the question earlier, but it sounds like every time I ask it, you got something else. Is there anything else that they they can do aside from just the um, uh, just the the breathing and the and that part? Is it like are there certain movements that also can create that? Well, the the part that you have to, we have to acknowledge is that when people when a, your body or your child's body is in a certain physiological state there's a propensity to move when you're in certain states. So telling a child to not move is really very difficult when their body is really poised to go into a fight or flight or reactivity. So another way of dealing with this is something like team sports. And I'm going to explain why that's critical. So in team sports, you have movement, but there's another component going on. You're having face-to-face -face interaction. So you have the social interaction, which recruits this other part of the nervous system that functionally contains those mobilization or fight flight tendencies. So as long as we move and maintain social contact, it's another form of exercise. Mm -hmm. And an interesting phenomenon, of course, with the world of ADHD is that many people don't like to play with kids who are ADHD. They're kind of marginalized even on the playground. Yeah. And part of that is due to the fact that the kids in those physiological states lose their capacity to be aware of others. So people get hurt. And so what, and they get hurt because the social engagement, the face is not making face-to-face -face contact. So they're not picking up the cues of the interaction. So things that might be uh, simpler in terms of movement, dancing used to be a way that people exercise these systems because they moved and talked to each other or made face-to-face -face contact. Uh, uh, as, a, as a teenager, for me, team sports was very important because it was this uh, relationship. And as I got older, playing in wind ensembles or in uh, orchestral, orchestral groups provided the same type of co-regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people listening might have heard of drum circles. Drum circles are another one. There you're highly mobilized, you're banging away. But what are you doing when you're doing that? You're looking at a person, you're interacting on that level. And so that may be another reasonable exercise for children who have these types of issues. That's fantastic. Um, you, uh, in this program, you are going to uh, give the, um, the audience a free gift you have uh something that you're going to give them which we'll put in the link below this this video so if you're watching this there's a button below that you can click on to get this and what is that okay so i wrote a book it's called the pocket guide uh, for the polyvagal theory mm -hmm. and this is chapter one from it which is a neurobiology of safety so it talks about the physiological features that safety uh that when we feel safe this is what we're experiencing the important point of the chapter is that removal of threat is not equivalent to feeling safe. Right. So when your child is in a classroom, you say, well, there's no real threat. 
but the child's physiological state is prepared for fight flight. Mm -hmm. So we know that the physical removal of threat is not the equivalent of the body feeling safe. And that's what this chapter is about. Got it. Uh, is it to uh, include the safe and sound protocol? Is that included in this chapter or in the book? Or where's that? Um, it's briefly discussed in the book, uh, but the book is easily available. Uh, but if people are interested in the safe and sound protocol, they just need to Google it. Uh, there's a web page on it. It's distributed by a company called Integrated Listening Systems. Mm -hmm. uh, there's interesting Facebook forum in which more than uh, 3,500 families are on it of the uh, discussing their kids and whether it will work for them and their experiences. It was formed by a parent who had a child who was aggressive and was so problematic that the, you know, the parents were being hurt by the kid hitting them all the time and they were prepared to put the kid in residential treatment and the kids mainstream now. And so this was their, the woman created this to share this with the world and share the discussion. And this is not a promise that everyone who does that will have those types of effects, but it, for her, it was a miraculous change in how her child behaved. And which was really an interesting phenomenon because what you start seeing is if you shift the physiological state of the child, from a state of autonomic defensiveness, what comes out? Who are we really? And that's what this intervention was about. Got it, got it. So um, let's see, is, which book is the Safe and Sound Protocol in? That they, if the parents want to find that, where would they find that in detail? Uh, in the details on it, I would go to the webpage because there are published articles on it and it tells where it's going and, got it. and parents are responding. Um, because it's not, oh, it, it's not really written in great detail in any of my books. Okay. Um, and actually, what I wanted to really do is write a book focused solely on it with uh, reports from the parents and descriptions of that. Got it. But at the moment, there are probably somewhere between uh, 10,000 people who have been impacted by the intervention at this point. So it's... Uh, it, it's becoming an interesting phenomenon out there. Great. Well, let's summarize where we're at right now. And um, just so uh, I make sure I've got it right in my head and you can make any corrections. Um, the polyvagal theory is basically how the physio uh, physio physiology of the body works, right? Hmm. And, um, uh, and, and how you can um, use different techniques to... Uh, calm the system down or change the state. One of them is breathing, and mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to trick your your body into breathing uh, or help your kids do it, if they're not going to breathe on their own, they're going to sit there and breathe with you. You might use music and you might use singing to help um, to help create that state and help them yeah. uh, basically calm their system down that way or, or change their state. Yeah. That, the, so the the point is, if we think of uh, ADHD as a state regulation issue in which the individual state is really well prepared to go into fight or flight, but poorly prepared or ill prepared to be socially engaging, to sit still and listen, to be present in a dialogue, mm -hmm. then the, we need to develop strategies in which we intervene to give the child a toolkit to move to shift state. Got it. Um, and and that's really what these tools are about. Got it. So so musical, wind instruments, singing, and team sports would be essential strategies for parents mm -hmm. to move forward. Yeah. And and the issue is that when your body's in a state of mobilization, mm -hmm. you have to move. Right. And now, if you realize that your body has to move, how do you kind of contain it? And you contain it with social interaction, with face to face, and that's where the team sports come in. And then individuals can sit as a group uh, as long as they maintain more interaction. So with ADHD, there is a confounding of problems because you're once in one, you're in the state of mobilization, mm -hmm. but there's also a deficit in engaging others for co-regulation. Uh, and, and so it's a pathway that needs to re reopen in an individual's nervous system for them to be more spontaneously engaging of others with facial expression and reciprocal interactions with others. 
Got it. So um, would that mean then if you were going to um, kind of encourage your child and push them towards team sports, uh, that you would stay away from golf and you would stay away from tennis and move more towards well, soccer and football? Uh, well, what's, what's interesting is, I mean, so if you think about golf, and I'm not, not a golfer, although I try occasionally, um, there's a lot of social interaction. There's walking and talking. Right. And with tennis, there's also walking and talking and face-to-face. -face. It may not be, if you play doubles, doubles tennis is really the, the real thing because you're relating. Mm -hmm. I think the issue really is, is it exercise or is it play? So if you go on the treadmill by yourself, it's exercise. But if you jog with a friend or go for a walk with a friend, it's co-regulation while moving. Got it. And so I think our, our culture has biased it to the mechanics and not to the social context. Got it. So if you're part of a swimming team, then swimming's okay. If you're swimming by yourself, probably not. And if well, it's not that it's not okay. It's different. It's different. Well, it doesn't create, the, it doesn't include the social. Con, uh, right. It's component. not going to enhance this ability to co-regulate with other. Got it. So it, we have to be always very careful about saying what's good and what's bad, because even hyperactive behavior is not bad in certain contexts. So it's the question is, can we really get our nervous system to work in the most optimal way in, a, in each in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And within polyvagal theory, there's a concept called neuroception. And that's where the body is literally, the nervous system is detecting cues of safety or danger or even life threat and adjusting the physiology to map into that. So when we talk about ADHD, we're really talking about the nervous system is often having a faulty neuroception. Is detecting risk when there is no risk at all. Yeah. And so the way to get them out of that is through getting that physiological state to change and really reinforming the body that there is no threat awesome. by being safe and trusting the environment. All right. Well, this is fantastic information. If you want more, um, if, if our audience wants more information about the polyvagal theory, uh, Dr. Porges, where do they find that? They can go to my webpage, which is stephenporges.com. There's a bibliography online, and there are also a list of various YouTubes uh, that are also online, and a list of the talks and workshops that I conduct. Got it. And that would be uh, Stephen, S T E P H E N, yeah. Porges, P O R G E S dot com. Dot com. And you go there, you can find more information about the polyvagal theory. If you click below, you can get uh, chapter one of uh, Dr. Porges' book, The Pocket Guide to the Polyvagal Theory. And uh, Dr. Porges, it was a pleasure having you on today. Lots of useful information and great strategies. Uh, and, and, you know, some parents already knew it was a good idea to put them in team sports. Now they know why. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe it's more of an incentive to get them there. So, yeah. and, and, and the musical component, you know, it's like it can be loud and noisy sometimes, but there's definitely a benefit better than having a meltdown or having a, you know confrontation so yeah, awesome. yeah well, well thank you Bob the other the bottom line take home is our bodies are on a quest for safety and sometimes if our body detects that there's risk in the environment we're going to be aggressive but our quest is still to be safe and if we interpret the behaviors even the maladaptive behaviors of ADHD children in that model we then become supportive uh, to try to shift the state of the individual so they can experience trusting and loving interactions. Awesome. Great way to end it. An important note. Thank well, you thank very you. much, Dr. Porges. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank All you. All right. And thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll, we'll see you on the next episode of the ADHD Toolbox. Talk soon.